May your struggles keep you near the cross, and may your troubles show that you need God, and may your battles in the way they should, and may your bad days that God is good, and may your whole life prove that God is good. May your struggles keep you near the cross, and may your troubles show that you and may your battles in the way they should, and may your bad days prove that God is good, and may your whole life prove that God is good. May your And may your troubles show that you need God. And may your battles in the way they should. And may your bad days prove that God is good. And may your And may your whole life prove that God is good. Um, I'm going to be reading Mark 11, verses 1 through 10. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it, and will send it back immediately. Okay, that would be quite strange. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you, un what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Um, it may be on Zoom, but it is, right? You know, I mean, that's the important thing. And, and we've all had to get used to that, you know, that uh, there's been this massive disruption and somehow we figured out how to, how to make it work, you know, um, and be ourselves and be together in the midst of all of this. So, um, it, it, it's a, a, a pleasure to be able to be with you, even if, even if in this attenuated kind of way. I didn't exactly look at the calendar and decide, oh, let's do Holy Week, you know, uh, Palm Sunday. I mean, it, it just like late, it was like later when I discovered that this was the one that worked. Um, it, it was like, well, here we are, you know, um, but which provides a really important opportunity, I think. Um, you know, because this this week um, is really at the very center of our faith, um, and that 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 we go on a journey during the course of this um, that is the journey of Jesus, really. And and what I want to do is kind of reflect on that journey of Jesus with you, but but to use the scriptures in a way that, that um, as you'll see in a moment, um, I've always been uh, struck by. 
um, the passion stories uh, of Jesus, you know, um, in one way, because there's so much devoted to about 20 hours worth of time, you know, from one evening after sundown, after dinner, until the next mid-afternoon. There is no other 20 hours in the life of Jesus that gets chapter after chapter and verse after verse and page after page and so on, you know. Um, some people have described the Gospels themselves as almost like passion narratives with, pro with extended prologue, you know, that we know almost nothing about Jesus from before the baptism, from the course of his public career that was perhaps three years. There's a lot of different stories and that go for, come from different traditions and so on. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you know, once the Last Supper is over, there's this chronicle that just unfolds. Um, as if somehow the story were very well known, you know, to um, the, uh, the early Christian community. A as you know, there's a kind of set um, uh, what, um, uh, what course of the narrative, it begins in the garden, um, the arrest happens, uh, Jesus uh, is then tried several different times first um, uh, before Jewish officials, finally before Roman officials, chiefly Pilate, although um, uh, Herod gets in there in the Lucan account, as I'll mention. Um, uh, he's brutalized by the guards. Um, eventually, he's sentenced to death. Um, he's given the cross. He uh, goes through the streets of Jerusalem with the cross, as, as all um, to be crucified did. Ends up at Golgotha, the place of the skull, uh, where he's crucified and uh, placed between um, uh, two other individuals. Uh, thieves or revolutionaries or something uh, like that. They're variously described. Um, and, and, and then he dies. Um, and then after he dies, something happens. You know, there's always a something that happens um, after his death. That's just, that's very important um, for all of the gospel writers. Um, you and I, when we tend to think of the, the death of Jesus or the passion, we probably uh, draw our images from the different gospels and kind of put, put them all together, you know? Like for example, a very popular uh, Good Friday um, uh, liturgical service is focused on the, the, la the seven words so-called uh, of Jesus. Um, whether it's Father forgive them for they do not know what they do or into your hands I commend my spirit or my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? We, we so draw all these words together as if somehow all of these happened in some setting, you know, and the thing is that you and I don't have any independent um, narrative of the of the death of Jesus apart from the four Gospels, and what's striking is how different they are. Um, and what I want to do is focus on that difference today by going through the the uh, passions according to um, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, I'm going to leave Matthew out in part because of time, but also because Matthew tends to follow Mark pretty closely. He adds some additional depth and dimensionality, especially the whole thing about um, the fulfillment of scripture. That's a huge uh, point of uh, Matthew, um, but, but it's, it's helpful for us just to kind of follow, I think, um, those three to get a sense of it. Um, uh, Mark was probably the first evangelist to write down the passion narrative, and so he establishes, as it were, um, the chronology of it and the, the, the sites and the locations and that kind of stuff. Um, and there's also a sense of gloom and foreboding that's just so thick you can cut it with a knife um, in, in Mark. Um, in, in the garden, for example, uh, Jesus declares to his disciples up front that um, that he is sorrowful even unto death. Those are his words about himself. And Mark the evangelist describes Jesus as troubled and distressed. So this, this sense of Jesus just being completely undone. He comes to the garden with his disciples. He withdraws a distance with Peter, James, and John. Then he goes a little bit further. He falls on the ground and prays this just wrenching prayer about how he doesn't want what's going to happen to happen. If it's at all possible for uh, God, to, uh, um, who, for whom all things are possible, uh, to make sure that this cup passes him by, then, then, then fine, but, but not his will, but uh, God's will be done. He goes back and finds the disciples asleep, upbraids them. Uh, this happens three times, <laughs> you know, so uh, uh, we're not, he's not describing each one, but you get the sense 
um, that it, it's just a kind of a, something that, that, that becomes almost worse and worse, bleaker and bleaker and bleaker. It's also noteworthy that God does not respond. You know, that there's no sense that God delivers him. He doesn't come out of this with a sense of, um, well, okay. Um, rather, the, 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 um, uh, the arresting party shows up. Um, there's a bit of sword play, um, and somebody slices the ear of the high priest's uh, servant. That happens in all of the Gospels. Uh, Jesus, except for a few words, is almost numb. It's like he just entrusts himself, um, surrenders himself into the hands of the authorities. The farther into the passion narrative you go, the less Jesus has to say, um, as if somehow he is being kind of um, betrayed and abandoned step by step and is feeling more and more and more desolate uh, the farther he goes. So the disciples begin that process of abandonment by their sleep, but there's a really interesting detail that also happens at the arrest. This only happens in the Gospel of Mark. There's a young, a young man unnamed uh, who is clothed only in a linen garment. The, the uh, temple officials grab a hold of him and he wiggles out of his um, garment and runs away naked. Um, so Mark is the only one to tell this why. Well, if you think about it, at the beginning of the gospel, the disciples leave everything to follow Jesus, right? Here's somebody leaving everything behind to run away. Um, so it's again, that sense of abandonment. Um, there are the trials um, that occur uh, just as, uh, as happen in, in uh, the rest of the Gospels. Uh, Jesus begins by speaking a bit, but then is mute. He doesn't defend himself. Um, there's, there's no one there to take his, uh, take his part. Peter issues his three denials. You know, that's one of the standard features that shows up in all the Gospels. But in Mark, what's striking is that the third time, he doesn't simply deny Jesus. He curses him, okay, curses him. Um, that's, again, a feature unique to Mark. It underlines the sense of complete abandonment that Jesus is feeling at this time. Um, Jesus is given the cross and uh, apparently has a difficult time carrying it. Simon of Cyrene is drafted in um, to be of help to finish uh, carrying the cross to the um, to the place of the execution. Um, there, uh, he's mocked by the crowd. Uh, his garments are divided, sort of ripped away from him. So more abandonment and so on. Um, his last words are, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I suspect the way you have to emphasize that is, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? You know, that it emphasizes that there's no one left to take the part of Jesus and, and he's not even experiencing this close relationship that he always had with the one he named Abba, Father. Um, and his last words aren't even a word, really. It's this cry. He cries out and then dies. Um, so there's this just wordless howl uh, at the end of it. And so what you see is this, again, that this process of the steady abandonment of Jesus um, and his being mute in front of it, a sense of just total loss and agony, and his death is accompanied by this wordless howling cry. What's striking, though, is something happens immediately. Two things. Uh, one is that the temple curtain is torn in half. The other is that the centurion on duty looks at Jesus and says, truly, this was the Son of God. Why are those two things important? The trial of Jesus turned on two things. One, the, his, his uh, claim that he would destroy the temple and then raise another one not made by hands in three days. And the second, that he was he, the claim that people reported that he said that he was the son of God. Um, so the centurion, when the centurion says that truly this was the son of God, this is the first time in the gospel that a human being says, this is the son of God. Even Peter at Caesarea Philippi um, halfway through Mark's gospel, when Jesus turns to his disciples and says, uh, who do you say that I am? What Peter says is, you are the Christ. In other words, the anointed one. He does not say you are the son of God. Uh, so this is the first time that a human being confesses that Jesus is the son of God. And this ripping of the, uh, of the temple curtain in two is the uh, symbolic destruction of the temple, uh, as you will, in fulfillment of the words of Jesus. So if Jesus' sense of abandonment is so total and complete and so on, what happens curiously is at the death of Jesus, God vindicates him um, in this incredible, incredible way. Luke's world is a very different world from the world of Mark. Um, 
it begins once again in the garden, but it begins in a very different way. Mark, or rather, Luke does not describe Jesus in the way that Mark describes uh, Jesus. If there's anybody who's sick with sorrow, it's the disciples. They fall asleep because they're sleeping from sorrow. Um, Jesus only has one of those rounds of prayer, not three. He does not fall on the ground. Um, he seems to come to terms with his fate in a way that he does not come to terms with that in the gospel of, of Mark. Um, instead, he goes to face, his, face the uh, crowd who comes to see him. Uh, once again, uh, somebody draws a sword and cuts the uh, ear of the high priest's servant. Only in the gospel of Luke does Jesus reach out and, and heal that ear, uh, which is a very striking kind of tender moment, if you will. Um, there are the, the trials that follow um, between the, the Jewish leaders first and then the Roman leaders, because remember, only the Romans can put him to death. Um, but there's a kind of a curious thing. It's not just Pilate. Pilate sends him to Herod because he decides that since uh, Jesus is a Galilean and Herod is in charge of Galilee, Herod should be the guy to see him. Um, but then Herod determines that no, Pilate should, so he sends him back to Pilate. That's the only, Luke is the only gospel where that happens. The curious thing is that Luke describes um, Herod and Pilate as having been enemies. From this point on, they become friends. That somehow their interchange over Jesus cures and heals their friendship, which is a very striking thing. Um, after Jesus is being, has been sentenced to death, he's um, uh, scourged and, and uh, crowned with thorns and the rest of it and given the cross and goes out on the way of the cross. There are three elements that Luke has that are really, that, that are unique to Luke and very striking. One is that he encounters what Luke refers to as the weeping daughters of Jerusalem, and he comforts them, Jesus comforts them, saying don't weep for him, but weep for uh, Jerusalem and the destruction which will come upon it, weep for themselves, and so on. Second thing is that as Jesus is crucified, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Um, the third episode has to do with the two, the two revolutionaries, thieves, whatever, between whom he's crucified. In Mark, the two, the, even the two of them uh, mock Jesus. Um, you said you were the son of God, come down, and so on. And so in, in Luke, one of them does, but the other upbraids that one, you may remember. Um, and this one says to Jesus, um, uh, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, I promise you that this day you will be with me in paradise, um, which is very striking. Uh, the last words of Jesus are completely different in the gospel of Luke, of Luke than they are in the gospel of Mark. No, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? A sense of loss and alienation, even from God. Rather, um, uh, Jesus in the gospel of Luke, his last words are, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. As if there's this trust um, that there's a process which he himself doesn't understand, but into which he can trust. Um, once again, as in Mark, right after the death of Jesus, things happen, two things. One is that the centurion declares, truly this man was innocent. Not truly this man was the son of God, but truly this man was innocent. And meanwhile, all the people who had followed along after Jesus, mocking him, in, in hearing the testimony of the centurion, are convinced that he's correct. And they turn and go home weeping and beating their breasts. So in other words, they're drawn to great repentance on the basis of it. So if you look, look at Luke all the way through the healing of the servant's ear, the, um, the, the consoling words to the daughters of Jerusalem, the forgiveness of the so-called good thief, the forgiveness of the people crucifying him and so on. What emerges from this is this remarkable portrait of the cross as a place of grace and healing and reconciliation and forgiveness and compassion. It's just, it's a very powerful and very different image of the cross than you see, um, than you find in the gospel of, of Mark. And John is, is its own world, um, very, very different. Um, it's hard, it's important to understand that the passion of Jesus caps a kind of um, ministry in Jerusalem that Jesus has been conducting for some time, many chapters. 
um, in John's gospel. During the course of that, he's referred repeatedly to his passion, asked questions like, well, should I have this cup pass, away, pass me by? Oh, but it's for this reason that I came. Then voice of God comes like thunder uh, and says, yes, you're, I, I, will glor I have glorified your name and I will glorify your name still. Um, Jesus at another point um, refers to the Old Testament uh, episode where the uh, Israelites are being bitten by these um, serpents and Moses raises a serpent on a uh, image of a serpent on a pole up so that they look at that they can be relieved of, of their distress and Jesus says that when I am raised up uh, or when I am lifted up not raised up from the dead but lifted up on the cross I will draw all people to myself um, so it's not so surprising that that when Jesus approaches the the uh, the passion the gospel of john he's ready for it he's ready for it you know he strides right into it there is no agony in the garden in the gospel of john none <laughs> none so jesus and his disciples get there pretty soon the the uh, 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 judas and the temple guard show up there's this interesting dialogue that goes back and forth um uh jesus says for whom are you looking and they say jesus of nazareth and he says i am that's the key phrase, right? I am. That is like how God identifies God's self. I am. That's what, what the burning bush said to Moses when Moses said, what's your name, right? At the, and when Jesus says this, what happens? The temple guard falls on its face in the ground. Um, so unlike in the gospel of Mark, where Jesus is the one on the ground, right? Here, it's the temple guard, sort of like awed by the glory um, of Jesus. Um, all this kind of continues um, at the trials. Um, it's the same kind of format as we've seen in Mark and Luke. First, uh, a set of trials before the temple officials, then uh, before the Roman officials, but all the way through, Jesus is the one in charge. You have to wonder kind of who's on trial here because Jesus is off, oftentimes acting as the, more or less as the prosecutor, you know? And this is especially true with Pilate. He's very clear to Pilate that two of them have a wonderful dialogue, that Pilate has no authority except the authority given to him, you know? This is a, a, a remarkable kind of display of confidence and bravado before somebody who's on the verge of being um, uh, sentenced to death, that Pilate has this power. Uh, and Jesus says, you don't have any power, uh, basically. Um, one of the interesting things in the Gospel of John is, is how the Gospel of John plays with the theme of Jesus's kingship. So in all the Gospels, Jesus is scourged, dressed in a purple robe, mocked by the, um, uh, uh, the guards, he's crowned with the, the, the thorns and so on. Then they take the, the purple cloak away, give him his own clothes back, and, and on it goes with the, um, with, with the, um, uh, the way of the cross. Uh, John interrupts that. And so after Jesus is dressed in the purple robe, crowned with thorns, Pilate brings him out and shows him to the crowd and says, behold the man, dressed in the robes of the king and crowned. Um, there's um, uh, another episode then um, when, um, when Pilate is seated on his uh, judgment seat um, uh, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Gabbatha. Um, and he presents Jesus to the um, temple officials. He refers to, to Jesus as their king. They deny it, um, and th there's a dialogue around that. Um, all of the gospels agree that, um, uh, that, the, that the charge um, with which you're, uh, the reason that for your crucifixion is sort of posted with you, and in the case of Jesus, it was the king of the Jews. Okay, so they, they all say that, but John underlines it. Um, so he that's posted, but then the temple officials came back and say, you shouldn't say king of the Jews, you should say this man claimed to be king of the Jews, which allows Pilate to say what I've written, I've written. Um, in other words, he's not going to say he, the man only claimed to be the king of the Jews. He's going to let the title, the king of the Jews stand. Um, and so there's this tremendous emphasis here. Um, so the words, the last words of Jesus are significant, just as in Mark and just as in Luke. 
Here, um, it's again, Jesus is in complete control. You almost have this sense that he's orchestrating his death. This has to happen, then this has to happen. In order for scriptures to be fulfilled, he must say, I thirst. So he says, I thirst. They bring him some, uh, some wine, sour wine on a stick to uh, drink. He does that. He says, it is finished. He says that, bows his head and surrenders his spirit as if somehow he chooses the moment to die and does so. Um, and once again, things happen. So um, the first thing that happens um, is that, as you may remember, a soldier kind of surprised that he's died so fast, lances his side with the spear, out comes blood and water, symbols of the Eucharist and baptism. Recall he said that when he was raised up or lifted up, he would draw all people to himself. So he's drawing them through the Eucharist and through baptism. Second thing that happens is he's taken down from the cross and buried. He's wrapped in linen um, and he's going to be placed in somebody else's grave, Joseph of Arimathea. But the striking thing, and this is only in John, is he's anointed with a hundred pounds of oil and myrrh. Imagine uh, of aloes and myrrh. Imagine a hundred pounds of cold cream or something like that, right? That is like a lot of aloes and myrrh. This is a royal burial, okay? Um, and we're, we're intended to see that, you know. So if in the gospel of Mark, you have this abandonment of Jesus that leads to his vindication by God. If in Luke, what you have is the, um, the cross depicted as this um, place from which the saving mercy, love, healing, forgiveness of God streams forth. In John, the, the cross is the place from which uh, uh, God in Jesus reigns. Um, in a very powerful way. So why all this? Um, because I think it poses a question for us, which is what is the cross of Christ for us? You know, you have three answers um, in, math, in, in Mark, in Luke, and John. Um, but each one of us as a Christian have to come to terms with what the cross of Christ is for us. And that's going to be something different depending upon what we're going through, right? Because there's going to be those, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me moments, right? Where we, we understand the mark in Jesus, you know, because we go through that ourselves. But there are also going to be other moments where we experience in powerful ways that we cannot understand or explain the saving love and mercy and healing of God all of which, according to Luke, comes straight through the cross. No other way uh, that they're available to us but through um, the death of Jesus as, as he died them. This is who God is revealed on the cross in, in the splendor of his mercy and his forgiveness and his healing love. And then there are those other moments where we really need to trust in Jesus as the one who has been given to us um, and who reigns in a particular kind of way and to call him our king. Um, and so my hope for you is uh, in these days um, that no matter where you are, kind of along your own journey, that you can look at the cross and see something there that's there for you. That's the other piece of this, right? You know, that Jesus' death upon the cross is a death for us. Which, does, which means, yes, all of us collectively overall, to be sure, but it means he's, his death was for each one of us individually as well in the midst of our own particular humanity. And however it is that we, we need that sense of love. So I hope that as you go forward during these days that are so important for our faith, um, and as you hear the story of Jesus, that you can attend to the particulars of the story and see uh, the, the gospel writers kind of working out very carefully um, how they see this story um, and what this story might mean for you. Thank you.
you see of me?